Okay, now we're ready for our last speaker of the day. It's Tal Avgar, who will be talking about analyzing caribou space use as a cognitive movement process. Thank you, Roger. Thank you for uh, coming. I'm going to talk about some of the work that I did uh, through my uh, PhD and then a short postdoc with John. I'm now at the University of Alberta, but this work was done at the University of Guelph. Um, so I'm going to start with the ecology of the system. We're dealing with uh, the boreal ecotype of woodland caribou. This, uh, this uh, uh, subspecies or ecotype has been uh, experiencing range retraction and population decline, uh, at least in, in Ontario, but it's, it's threatened throughout its range in North America. And, and the leading hypothesis for why that is, is increased predation. Uh, the main predator across most of the range are, is uh, wolves. And, and one of the leading hypotheses uh, behind this increased predation, or why do wolves eat so many caribou, uh, is that we have increased moose habitat. And we create this moose habitat by cutting down, cutting down forest. Uh, so timber harvest, we have a lot of young forest, that's prime habitat for moose. We have a lot of moose, which is the major prey for wolves. And as a result, we have a lot of wolves. Uh, so this is the apparent competition hypothesis where the apparent competitor is the moose. And, and obviously there's uh, a, an alternative or an addition, additional cause that I have to say is less popular, at least in, in the community that, that studies uh, caribou, and that is reduced forage abundance. Uh, caribou feed mainly on lichen, but on a lot of other things. And, and obviously, that's a possibility for, for a population decline. They just don't have enough resources. So bottom up versus top down. If you want. So these questions are very difficult to answer. Uh, these animals live in very remote areas. We rarely observe them. They're somewhere in the forest. And, and one way to start uh, dealing with these questions is asking what do the animals do in the, at the behavioral level. Uh, and, 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 and if the, those animals move adaptively and they make adaptive decisions, then those decisions might inform us what's important for them at the fitness level, at the demographic level. And, and to do that, we need several important components. We need positional data, good quality positional data. In this case, I'm going to talk about 30 different individuals at uh, yearly trajectory at five hour resolution, GPS data. We need maps of major ecological drivers that might, might influence the decision making in space use. And we need a model that we can plug these into and get some inference from. And I'm going to start by talking about this component, which is, I think, a unique component of this project, because we've invested a lot of time and effort in actually getting those, rather than just using land covers or just using NDVI, trying to get something that may be links more to the ecology of the animal. And, and just in, as a couple of examples, I'm going to talk about briefly how we created maps of wolf density across these landscapes. And this involves many people, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of stages. But basically, we're collecting a lot of movement data on, on wolf packs. We're feeding uh, kernels using brown and bridges. Uh, this is work done by many uh, students involved in this project, uh, combining these, these kernels into a single drape over the landscape, and then uh, modeling uh, that drape statistically using remote sensed variables so we can extrapolate across at least the whole range that we're interested in. And what we're getting are seasonal maps of wolf densities. And um, just to... Uh, show you, give you the feel of how this looks. This is a caribou trajectory, a single caribou, single year, and, and uh, this map in the background are the wolf density averaged across the, uh, across the seasons. For this caribou, purple is high density, blue is low density, and again, we'll, we'll be asking how did the caribou respond to these uh, maps. We do the same exercise for, for foraging, for forage abundance using completely different methods, but the principles are the same. We collect tons of data, we, we convert that data using other data into uh, digestible biomass, we convert that digestible biomass into dietary digestible biomass using camera colors so we know what the animals are eating uh, through the cameras, we know, we know the diet composition so we can weigh what we have in each site based on the diet composition, and, and we're getting the, the dietary digestible biomass in each location that we sampled in the landscape, and then we model these 
as a function of all of those remote sensed variables, NDVI, land cover, DEM, and we get predictive model of forage abundance. And we, again, this is uh, uh, the same caribou that I showed you before, the same trajectory over a map of, of forage abundance. Again, the, the uh, purple is the high uh, forage abundance spots averaged across the year. And we repeat this exercise for moose habitat. In this case, we don't have moose densities per se, but we have the RSFs for the moose based on aerial surveys and snow depth. And I'll shortly talk about how snow depth, snow depth goes into this. The snow depth map is obviously way more temporally dynamic. This is in 16 day resolution. So every 16 day, we have a new map coming in, covering the entire landscape, telling us what is the projected snow depth. Now, as we said, the next component that we need is a model that we can plug this into and get inference. And I have some equations here. I'm not going too much into the equations. I talked about that yesterday in my tutorial, and I'm happy to answer any questions later. And this method is, is published, so you can also, also access it in the literature. But basically, the model is based on the idea of a redistribution kernel. It's a model of the probability of the animal occurring at a specific location, J, and J here is an index of a location, any location in 2D space, at a specific time, T. And that probability is a function of a non-cognitive or non-resource or non-habitat related uh, movement kernel, which we think is, has two main components to it. It has a, 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 a basal movement capacity that's a parameter of the model, and it has the snow depth effect. We expect animals to move more slowly through deep snow because of uh, permeability. So this is a, a physical effect on the animal. And the other component is a resource selection function. But that resource selection function doesn't operate on, on uh, the habitat as we measure it, as we model it, as we map it, but rather is, uh, the habitat as we think the animal perceives it. And this is the, the second unique feature here is that we're, we're trying to also account for what, uh, the, to the best that we can, to what the animal knows about the landscape, not what the satellites know about the landscape. Uh, so, so these are already uh, uh, two parameters for the movement and one parameter for each habitat component that we have in the resource selection function. And, and this is just to briefly explain how the perceived part works, so what the animal knows about those habitat qualities is, is governed by this recursion equation that is updated through the trajectory. And again, I'm not going in too much into details, but, but the gist of it is that we have, uh, we model sensory information perceived by the animal at each step as a function of, a, of an exponential decay function that is governed by a sensory attenuation coefficient alpha. So that's another parameter in the model. We have uh, uh, whatever is not perceived is complemented by memory, what the animal perceived in previous steps, that is governed, the, the memory decays through time, and the rate of memory decay is governed by the memory decay coefficient beta. And whatever is not remembered, either because the animal never perceived it or because it's already forgotten it, is complemented by a default uh, expectation that is the third cognitive parameter of this model. And in what I'm going to show today, that parameter was fixed. And the assumption is that what the animal doesn't know, it assumes what it experiences right now. So this va value here is temporally dynamic. It changes from step to step based on what the an animal experiences right now. So we have three cognitive parameters and uh, a bunch of other parameters that I showed you before. And, and we now need to estimate those parameters using the landscape layers and tra the trajectory. And we do that using the fact that the redistribution kernel gives us a probability of the animal occurring at each location in the landscape. And if we have a probability, we have likelihood-based <coughs> parameterization. Uh, we do that using <coughs> The product of all occurrence probabilities along the whole trajectory is the likelihood of that trajectory given the model of the redistribution kernel, and in our case, the parameters of interest. So for a given parameter set, for a given parameter values, we have a given likelihood. And that enables parameterization. In this case, I'm using Markov chain Monte Carlo to get that parameterization, so to get posterior distributions for each one of the parameters. Results. I'll start with the ecological part. So uh, these figures will all look the same, or more or less the same. What we have here is the selection coefficient. 
in this case for forage abundance. So the dietary digestible biomass, this is measured in uh, grams per square meter. And each dot here is an individual. So we have 30 individuals, zero is indifference. As those of you who deal with resource selection functions know that if you have zero, the animal is not responding to, the, to that habitat. If we have a positive value, the animal is selecting for. If we have a negative value, the animal is selecting against. The confidence bands are taken from the posterior distribution, so those are Bayesian uh, uh, confidence bands if you want. And, and what we have here on the x-axis is the average dietary digestible biomass for the range of each of those animals. And what I want you to get from this is that we have a lot of variation across where these animals live. These all can be considered the same population. We didn't really test that, but there's a lot of variation in the space that they occupy in terms of that resource, uh, almost a two-fold variation. And this may look very noisy, but if you ever actually fitted RSFs or SSFs to individuals, you would find that most data looks very noisy. And, and what's important for us is the inference at the population level. And when we look at the population level, we see that the majority of our individuals are selecting, even strongly selecting, for forage. So that kind of fits well with what we understand about the system and what we would expect. Same idea for uh, predator abund abundance. Uh, here we have the average density of wolves for each one of those caribou ranges at the x-axis. And again, we have maybe not such a strong pattern, but most of our individuals are actively avoiding densely populated uh, oh, dens areas that are densely populated by wolves. And finally, for uh, moose habitat, we have, uh, in this case, about half of our individuals are actively avoiding moose habitat, and the other half are indifferent. And if we want to look at this at, as, as the whole scheme of all three variables that we put in here, uh, this is just without the confidence bands. You can see the overall population trends. We have avoidance of predation risk through these two variables, and we have selection for abundant forage. So basically well, what we would expect uh, uh, in terms of, of what, we, what we expected to see, what uh, the effects of these ecological factors. So moving on to some other parameters of the model, we're inferring all of those parameters simultaneously. There are no uh, two steps here, right? All the inferences simultaneous. Here we have uh, the observed median speed for each one of those individuals at the x-axis and the non-cognitive median speed calculated from these two parameters that we infer for each one of the individuals uh, for on, on the y-axis. And we see a very good fit, very good match between the two, which we would expect. This is basic movement parameters that the model should be able to fit very well. And, and the only uh, thing that, that is, I think is very interesting here is that we actually have lower movement rates predicted by the model than what we see in reality. And this is not because the model is wrong, but because uh, this, this is the non-cognitive movement rate. So this is just part of the movement process. The movement, the movement pattern as we see it emerges from whatever the animal can do and what the, whatever the animal want to do. And, and our model separates these two effects. So this tells us that at least at, at this high end of the range, the long movements are probably due to response to the environment rather than just to limitation to movement capacity. For uh, the, the sensory range, we can convert this into the median sensory range uh, just to, to make it more interpretable. And this is on the log scale, as you can see here on the x-axis, we just have the caribou ID, 30 individuals, and you can see a huge variation, which is not a good thing because we would not expect different individuals to vary that much in, in something that is so fundamental, uh, that is probably governed by physiology rather than, than ecology. Uh, and, and I think this is an indicator that we still have some, some road ahead of us to, to get this really working uh, nice. But, but overall, the, all of these individuals f fall within what we would consider the reasonable range for, for a perceptual radius for an animal living in a forest. So this is somewhere between you know, 20 meters and 200 meters, which is more or less what, what we think is, is going on. And lastly, for the memory retention, 
we have, I didn't go into this, but we have informative priors in these models, and, and those informative priors represent null models of, of what, the, what the parameters can converge to if we don't have enough information in our data to actually tell us what is the real decay rate of memory in this case, and all 30 individuals have converged to no decay whatsoever. So this tells us, A, you don't have enough information to tell you something quantitative about memory, and B, qualitatively, those individuals use memory. They, they go back to places they have information on and they like, and they avoid places they have information on and dislike, and there is no indication that this memory decays at the period of the study. So to conclude, we have partial support for the apparent competition hypothesis because we have the same individuals avoiding high wolf densities and avoiding moose habitat, which is an indication that, that moose habitat is an important component in their ecology uh, in, in addition to, to uh, wolf habitat or wolf density. Forage availability may be a very important limiting factor for boreal caribou judging from uh, the very strong signal that we get from those individuals selecting over uh, at that small scale for, for abundant forage. Uh, inferring co cognitive capacities from movement data, possible, but challenging, and we're not there yet, almost. And, and specifically for this system, caribou do decide where to go based on limited sensory information and long-term memory, although we don't know how long. So I would like to conclude by thanking all of those people that have contributed vastly to this work on the modeling side, on the data side, and all of those organizations that were involved in uh, this pr project and are still involved. And thank you for your attention. And we can have questions. Yes, or. So for your first question, um, yes, there is the possibility that sensory range is, is modulated by the environment in dense forest versus open forest or in mountainous, you know, where you have mountains that block your view. And there are works in the literature that actually address this. This is a very flat landscape. And in terms of forest density, it's hard to say that forest density really changes uh, drastically between the, the ranges. What changes is the abundance of forage. Uh, but, but, you know, different forests support different forage base, but not necessarily impaired vision in a different way. And I couldn't find any correlates that explain this variation at the, at the individual level. Uh, but there might be something out there that we just don't know of. Uh, and and um, for the predator avoidance, what the, the phenomena that you're describing, the, a, a response in the, in the selection coefficient to the actual abundance of that variable over the range is called um, uh, a function response in the resource selection function, or often in the, in the RSF literature. And, and in this case, in this model, I wouldn't expect that due to statistical reasons. So a function response in RSF can arise due to statistical reasons because the abundance also changes the variance and that changes the selection coefficient. And it can rise due to behavior reasons. So the animal might actually adjust its selection based on the abundance that it has. And it has a lot to do with whether this is a limiting resource or not and so on. Uh, I, I think our modeling approach kind of excludes this, the statistical reasons because of the way we model uh, things. So this is closer to step selection function than to a uh, resource selection function. I can't tell you about the behavioral uh, uh, response, but I, my basic expectation is, is that the animals should have very similar preference to, to a specific habitat component. Uh, their behavioral norms should be the same. Yes, when you look at it as an RSF over a landscape, you might get different coefficients, but the behavioral norms should be very, very similar. And by the way, those, uh, all of those variables were um, standardized before they went into the model, so they have the same magnitude. So this is why we can actually look at their 
the selection coefficient on the same scale. The range in wolf density is not very large. The, the spread range spread it out over the whole slide, but, but the range wasn't very big. So the range in wolf density um, is actually way, way, way smaller than the range that we have over this uh, landscape in general. So just to get you an idea, we, uh, the highest uh, wolf densities that we have are somewhere here. That's about 13 wolves per thousand square kilometers. Uh, those areas are rarely occupied by caribou. So there's a different level of selection, the home range selection if you want, that we're not even going into here, that th those 30 individuals are just not representing those very uh, wolf abundant area, either because the wolves ate all the caribou that was there or because the caribou is smart enough not to occupy those. Well, based on these models, it doesn't get lower than that in this landscape. So uh, this system is, a, is a, probably a wolf goose system further north up above this area. And, and as long as you have moose at some density, even at low densities, you have some wolves. But again, remember, this is model projections. So it's, it's linked to the real data, but it's not the real data. So, okay, this is, these are five hour steps, and yes, you're completely right. This is, the inference is true for, this, for the temporal scale at which we model it. That's true for the, for the parameter values in, in the quantitative way, not necessarily in the qualitative way. And again, I I'm, can refer you to the ecological modeling uh, paper where we actually test the sensitivity to scale of, of this kind of modeling approach. But, but overall, this cannot address having, making decisions at two separate scales simultaneously. So if the animal decides that it's, it want to be, you know, somewhere 20 kilometers from here next week, and now it's planning its path there, this model does not account for it. It accounts for movement from five hour to five hour in this case, making decisions at each one of those points. Yes, new. I'm, I'm not sure about caribou. Um, so caribou is not the ideal species for this kind of model in general. But yes, overall I would say that, that I think the most promising approach to get into the issue of memory use uh, is to use either, either tag juveniles, as we heard a lot of yesterday, or, or tag uh, displaced individuals, you know, introduced populations, that where we know that the animal is naive, and then we can, we we know that the animal knows nothing, and and whatever data we have allows us to say something about what the animal knows. Otherwise, we're we're left in problematic situation where we don't know what the animal has experienced before. Yeah, I yes, I agree. Sorry. Problem bears, you mean? No, like, bears. well, if you can tag the juveniles, but <laughs> they live a long time. If they can remember for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think what would be ideal for this are, are to start with, not the smartest animal and one that is relocated to an <laughs> into a <an> naive landscape. <laughs> I mean, the smarter they get, the more difficult it is to get into How their heads. Sorry? How about microteams? Microteams? Yeah. Voles. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> That's possible. That's possible. Well, thank you for attending this, this session this afternoon. And